these people are too good for line markers. I got this keys, but it's near my some of these markers are probably being up here a year. So I come with my phone and say, marker. Can you get me a different picture? Yeah, I come with the same one. <laughs> <laughs> That's the part. <laughs> <laughs> that might be the only part, but it is a part. I'm going to stay away from the water mask because there will be traffic going on. I'm going to pop it on the summer side. And there is a marker that I know works that's right here. So feel free to use that marker, but then return it right here so it doesn't get mixed up with the dash that's useless on the side of the board. <laughs> OK, so we left off with innate immunity, so we just played this nice video that gave us an overview. So on physical barriers, and also we'll say that chemical barriers are also going to be that defense level one. So physical barriers, which there's plenty out there, and depending on the location of the body, there's different physical barriers. So there's the ciliary escalator that's hanging out in our airways, our lungs, and beyond there. And they're there to trap particles, microbes, bacteria, viruses, pollen also, all that gets trapped in the mucus. And then the ciliary escalator is constantly beating cilia in one direction. So it's trying to get stuff out of your lung. That way it either gets to the back of the throat and you cough it up, or you get to the back of the throat and then you swallow it and it gets digested in your stomach. Earwax that some of us are so fond of. So that's when you provide microbes or prevent microbes from actually getting into your ear from the outside. So naturally produce, some people do produce more ear bags than others, but it's not a bad thing to have ear bags. Urine, just by urination, of course, you're getting rid of waste products, but in that process, you're cleaning out the urethral tract just by the flow of urine. That's why you know, having or holding urine too long is not a good thing. It's also why, like, if you're diabetic, that tends to increase, or you tend to have increased numbers of infections, like urinary tract infections. There's more sugar in your urine, that sugar hangs out, and then if you don't, aren't regularly producing urine or getting rid of that urine, then that sugar provides extra nutrients for the bacteria. Also, like, men, at least, when you turn, like, 65 and older, you have an enlarged prostate that makes it harder to urinate that also has the same effect, like urine doesn't get completely flushed out from the urinary bladder. And that provides nutrients for bacteria, and also when you have an enlarged prostate, you're more likely to have urinary tract infection. Vaginal secretions in women can do some similar things, so they'll move microbes out of the vaginal tract as that secretion is produced. Then general processes like peristalsis, the movement of food through your intestinal tract, defecation, the movement of feces out of your intestinal tract, vomiting, like, you know, when you have something irritating your stomach, when you drank too much because of this class, all that kind of stuff, it's usually a good thing to vomit. Diarrhea is moving stuff when it hardly gets beyond your stomach, but it's in your intestines and you're getting it out, then it's going out the other way. So diarrhea is like vomiting through the other side. But one way or the other, you're either trying to get rid of microbes or toxic substances, like say too much alcohol, out of your gastrointestinal tract. So if we look at a cross section, some of the many things, so like saliva that our mouths are always producing, even whether you're eating or not, and of course you produce more saliva if you're like, oh, I want to really taste this food, or I smell the food that I love that smell. So then, of course, you produce more saliva. Saliva already carries enzymes in it that help with breaking down things. It starts the whole process of digestion. We remember amylase that breaks down starch. It's already in your saliva also, and it starts breaking down starch as you start chewing. The normal microbiota are also involved in that, which exists especially in your mouth, also down to your intestinal tract. And there are, of course, like we remember before, physically occupying space, they're preventing bad microbes from occupying that space. As you'll see, we have the cilia in your airways going into your lung. On the surface then, so nasal passages produce mucus, you produce the ear wax, you 
produce tears in your eyes, and your tears naturally have an enzyme called lysozyme that breaks down bacterial cell walls. In grocery stores, especially the big ones, like when they miss the, the produce at night with this pine spray, that all usually contains lysozyme in it, and that kills a lot of the bacteria that may have landed on like your fruits and vegetables in non-refrigerated zones. And that prolongs their life because if you kill off the bacteria, the food is less likely to spoil before someone says, hey, I can buy that. Uh, let's see, low pH on the surface of your skin, and that's caused by the oil and the sweat that your sweat glands and oil glands are producing. And then going through your body, if it's still in your stomach and above, you're going to vomit something irritable out. If it's below your stomach, you're going to defecate it out or urinate it out if it's in the urinary tract. Defecation, of course, then gets really active if you go through diarrhea. That's when you're really trying to project something out of your intestinal tract. When you talk about mucocutaneous membranes, so that's the lining of your digestive tract, your urinary tract, the vaginal tract in women, and the respiratory tract and the lining of your eyes. Basically, any surface that needs to be kept moist, it's kept moist because the mucus is secreted there, so that makes it a mucocutaneous membrane. They need to be kept moist and they need to be kept permeable. Unlike your like normal skin on your arms or legs where it's trying to be an impermeable barrier to infection, those kind of membranes, like the lining of your eyes or your intestinal tract, you want things to go through. You want to be absorbing nutrients through your intestinal tract. So you don't want that to be impermeable. In the process, the microbes, of course, can get through. Epithelial cells are going to be rapidly replaced. Like your intestinal tract cells are replaced usually every two days or so. Just by old age, a cell will die. And immediately when a cell dies and goes into your feces that's forming, or with, along with the food that's going through there, a new cell will quickly divide and fill its space, so you don't have open gaps in it. Mucus itself on an epithelial layer can prevent attachment, because it's not just like water, it's kind of a thicker substance, and that often will trap a microbe in that mucus rather than letting it get to the cells themselves. When we go through blinking and tear production, that keeps the eyes free of irritants, and that includes microbes. So it's a good thing when that happens. Not that you should cry during exams and say, oh, I'm just trying to get, you know, clear my eyes out. That's usually the emotional part of it. But in the process, it is good. The lacrimal apparatus is the apparatus that actually drains tears, and that actually drain some of that stuff into your nasal passages, which is why your nose starts running when you're crying, just for the very same reason, because your tear ducts drain also into your nasal passages. Human skin, so at the outermost layer, your skin is compacted, and that includes the protein keratin in that outermost layer. That's the part that's always coming off of your skin. You wake up in the morning and the rays of sun are waking you up and you see stuff floating around. A lot of that is the skin that's come off your body. It, this having that cemented outer layer makes skin hard to penetrate and it also makes it waterproof. That's why you can jump in a pool and not immediately like drown, like water doesn't just fill up your body. Shedding and then dryness also inhibit microbial growth. So you're constantly shedding your outer most layer of your skin. It's generally dry, so if the pathogen prefers a moist environment, it's not going to get it. That's why some microbes are like adapted to, say, the underarm environments, where it's commonly more moist because you're always sweating. If you looked at a cross section of your skin, this is the kind of layers you would have. So that outermost layer is already dead; it's just physically compacted there. And that's called the stratum corneum. That's the outermost layer of your epidermis. And then going down here, you have various layers. Eventually, you have a basal layer at the bottom that divides upward. And as the cells divide upward, their size decreases, and they become more and more compacted as they go upward. We also have sebaceous glands. And those are going to aid in waterproofing that epidermal layer. 
the basic Greek oil, oil and water don't mix. Thank you, Sarah, for using the awesome marker. Hey. <laughs> That's more like it. It's a weird number, but still, at least the color is a good color. Yeah. It looks well for a 30 degree side. You should be blue. You can't be green for being 30 degrees. They just don't go together. <laughs> so, as because oil and water don't mix, of course, as you secrete oils from the sebaceous gland, that's going to prevent water from going in there. Hairs and their follicles are regularly shed. Estimates are that the average person sheds about 100 hairs from their head per day. That's without getting old and dry and having dandruff and all that stuff. You're just naturally going to shed about that many hairs. And then, of course, that's not counting body hairs from other parts of your body. This is just hair from your head. Then you produce sweat glands, and, or you have sweat glands that produce sweat, and that, of course, cools you down on a hot summer day, but it will also flush out large areas of the skin, so any microbes that are within that area of a sweat gland also get flushed out. So if you took a cross-section of your skin, you have that epidermal outer layer, stratum corneum is at the top of that, then below that you have the dermis, and then below that you have the subcutaneous layer. And then interspersed in all these layers, you have the hair that are growing out of a hair follicle. You have the sebaceous glands that are producing oils, and then you have the sweat glands that are producing sweat. And you'll see when we get infections of the skin then, they're trying to get deeper and deeper into the tissue because the hair is sterile, there's no competition, there's lots of nutrients. The respiratory tract is going to be continuously exposed to lots of things that can annoy us. And that includes allergens for people that experience allergies, which we'll talk about in like a week and a half. There's usually some fun stories that come out of when we talk about allergies. But allergens go into our lungs, non-infectious microbes, things that aren't going to make us sick but we still breathe in, those go in there. And then of course the pathogens that actually will make but if you took a cross section going down in here, you have the trachea, or anyone that hasn't taken anatomy yet, you have the trachea, and then that's going to divide into each lung into a bronchus, and the bronchus then divides further into bronchioles, and then at the very end of that, as we'll see, there's alveoli, and that's where the actual gas exchange happens. But up here, from the trachea into the bronchus is where you have this ciliary escalator a whole bunch of respiratory ciliated epithelial cells that have these little projections that stick out and they're always going to beat rhythmically but always in one direction so it's not just like playing back and forth they're only beating in one way and they're moving mucus out back to your back of your throat so that then you'll either cough it up or you'll swallow when you sneeze you're pushing mucus out of your nasal passages because something's irritating them there, like your nasal hairs are being tickled and then you sneeze. Versus when you cough, then you're pulling something out of the, your lungs upward. So that's going to be when it's tickling like your trachea or possibly your bronchus. Hi, play a video of the mucociliary escalator. It's not the most exciting of voices, but it's good enough video I found to get the point across on how so the other thing we have in this are going to be the gallbladder cells, and they're the ones that are actually producing that mucus. The air we breathe contains foreign matter such as dust, bacteria, and pollen. They're like cells called cilia, as well as goblet cells, can be found in the lining of the respiratory tract called the respiratory epithelium. Goblet cells secrete viscous mucus that forms a layer to trap foreign material. The wave-like action of the underlying cilia mobilizes the mucus layer, removing the foreign matter and preventing it from entering the lungs. And that's going to be happening no matter whether you're breathing in particles or not. They're always moving mucus. They're always bringing it back up and then it's just by chance if there's something in there, 
of course, you will produce more mucus as if you're getting irritation. Allergies, for example, so you try to put that on. <laughs> Anything else like that, then of course, you try to produce more mucus. Some of these areas that are targeted by certain infections, like when you get the flu, that specifically targets that respiratory epithelium and it wipes it out for about two weeks. So then you don't have those cilia clearing out things from your lungs. That's why a lot of times people that get the flu go and get a secondary infection, like a bacterial infection. And that's usually what kills people that die of the flu is that they die from a secondary bacterial infection because those cilia are damaged. So both the skin and the mucocutaneous membranes are gonna produce a lot of chemicals that are also going to prevent from infection. So part of the prevention is that physical stuff that we just talked about. Part of it is the chemical stuff that I'm about to talk about. So a lot of different things work to target different pathogens or microbes. The sebaceous secretions, they're gonna have antimicrobial fatty acids that tend to break down like cell walls or bacteria and fungi but the oils that we secrete. Some people are like, oh, I got really oily skin. Oh, I gotta keep washing the oil off. But as you do that, it's actually bad for your skin if you keep your skin too dry and aren't having enough of the oil being produced. The lysozymes, like we said, that are in like your tears, those go hydrolyze bacterial cell walls naturally. The defensins, so those are gonna be small peptides, so small segments of amino acids that it will specifically damage bacterial and fungal membranes. They're gonna be made by both your skin cells and your intestinal cells, so they work in both locations. As we sweat, and even in, like say it's winter time, we still sweat, it's just not as dramatic as in the summertime, but we totally are still sweating. And that sweat has high lactic acid, so it lowers the pH of the environment, and high electrolyte concentration. So if you've been like freaking out about an exam in here and you're sweating bullets and you like some of the sweat drips into your mouth and you taste how salty it is. Very salty, but there's a lot of salt in there. Hydrochloric acid, that's gonna be specifically in the gastric juice that our stomach lining secretes constantly and that will often kill a lot of pathogens. Gastrointestinal pathogens have adapted to survive that low pH of the stomach. And then bile. Bile gets secreted by our liver, gets stored by our gallbladder also, but it's going to dissolve membrane lipids of pathogens in the intestines. This is also that thing like, oh, I can feel the bile bailing up in my throat, you know, oh, I see this on the exam and I can't stand it, like what some of you were saying about my awesome last year. So that kind of thing, but you're not actually having bile come up into your throat, that would be nasty. But that same kind of bile, though, is good at digesting microbial cell membranes. Now, going into the innate immune system, the actual cellular parts, things that are going to happen naturally, still non-specific. So, white blood cells. Thank you. So, white blood cells. Those are also called leukocytes. Those are the things the doctor may recommend. Oh, let give me a white blood cell count and the order of blood test. That's to determine your total amount of these cell types. And white blood cells, they're, a measure of that is determining how many leukocytes you have per like milliliter of blood. High and low numbers can give you different gauges that something is off. So having a high white blood, white blood cell count may indicate you have a bacterial infection, you have certain autoimmune diseases related to that. Side effects of some medications will actually increase your white blood cell count. On the low end, so there's usually a specific range of like this many to this many per milliliter of blood. And then if it's beyond that range, versus if there's a low white blood cell count, that often indicates a viral infection that are killing off your white blood cells. Certain pneumonias will actually lower your white blood cell count and then some autoimmune diseases will go the opposite way and lower your white blood cell count. Also certain cancers tend to decrease your white blood cells. So a lot of conditions and that's just often a first step in determining what's going wrong in your body is determining is it high white blood cells or low white blood cells. Yeah, there we go, there we go. 
Don't encourage her. <laughs> so some of the basics of immunology. Like three and a half minutes. We look at cells, so then yeah. we'll actually want to determine total white blood cell counts and specific types of white blood cells. I think she started to Usually you'll like grab some of the blood so and then like you'll either point? let it yeah. settle yeah. naturally or you'll spin it down at high speed. And then the bottom layer is gonna be the our actual red blood cells. You can see this as an obvious layer. And the top portion is going to be the plasma. That's gonna be the liquid portion with dissolved proteins but no whole cells. And then in between that is gonna be this thin layer that's gonna be your white blood cells. And that's what you're trying to measure, like what's the concentration. Average number, so five to 10,000 white blood cells per cubic millimeter, which is the same as one milliliter. Or you'll see it reported as up to 10 to the ninth or million white blood cells per liter of blood. And then out of these numbers, about 60 to 70% should be your neutrophils, and then lesser concentrations should be your lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. These last two are pretty small, so if they're elevated, that often indicates something like allergic reactions, weird like fungal infections, or helminths, worm infections. They tend to increase these couple. Two things that affect a natural response to a pathogen. So if you're a uh, immune natural white blood cell, how do you recognize that something is a pathogen? So those cells are going to have PRRs, pattern recognition receptors. And examples of those are the TLRs, or the toll-like receptors. They're on the surface of the host cells. They're going to attach to amps. So those are pathogen-associated molecular patterns things that are common to a lot of different pathogens, like peptidoglycan in the cell wall, a flagella, motile bacteria, that endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide of gram negatives. So all of those things stimulate different pattern recognition receptors. Pattern recognition receptors binding to those amps are gonna stimulate an immediate response. And that immediate response is gonna be release of chemicals called cytokines. They're small proteins, they get released by the host cell, and they're going to regulate you know, how intense the overall immune response is and how long that response is going to last. Now we're going into basics of location-wise what our immune system is made of. So we can split up our human body into four fluid-filled compartments. The reticular endothelial system, or RES, that's not really an immune direct component, but it helps move immune cells around. It's there for support and cell transport. So it's like the highways of your body. We have the extracellular fluid, or ECF. That's gonna contain nutrients, dissolved waste products, and gases. The actual bloodstream, so this is what's running through your arteries and veins. It carries actual cells, including red blood cells and white blood cells nutrients, waste products, and gases. And then the lymphatic system. So that's there to filter your extracellular fluid, and it can also detect pathogens. That's gonna be your lymph nodes. There are things when the doctor says, oh, let me feel your lymph nodes to see if they're swelled up. That's part of this lymphatic system. All of these systems are physically separated, but they are interconnected. And we'll see just like our lymphatic system and our blood stream you have too much fluid in your bloodstream, like you just drank that big gulp from 7-Eleven or Circle K or something. So that excess fluid will come out of your bloodstream, go into the extracellular fluid compartment, and that will go through the lymphatic system. And then after you pee a few times, blood volume decreases, then that lymphatic fluid will go back into your blood circulation. So these four compartments together make sure that there's no region, region of the body that doesn't have some level of immune protection. Starting with the reticuloendothelial system, so there's tissues of the body that are gonna be permeated by a really fine network, that's called a reticulum, made up of connective tissue fibers, and those are gonna serve as sort of the highway for cells to move along. These fibers are composed of a protein called collagen, 
giving you a supportive network for other cells in the tissue, like the actual tissue cells, lymphatic vessels, and blood vessels. So everywhere where you have blood vessels going through your body, you unknowingly also have lymphatic vessels because fluid needs to be able to move between the two types of vessels. Gives you a passageway through and between tissues. And as we'll talk about, some cells can migrate between different tissue types. So they can go like from your intestines to your kidneys to your nervous system, depending on where they're needed. Other cells are resident to those environments. So certain cells will only hang out in your liver and that's where they'll stay. Who's managing? <laughs> oh, anatomy. I'm mad at me. <laughs> We're always mad at you, James. <laughs> so, the reticuloendothelial system, here's our bodies. If we did a cross section, these purple regions are where there's a higher level of the reticuloendothelial system. So, within there, so you did a cross section. This could be your liver, your kidneys, anything like that. So you have the actual tissue cells, like liver cells making up the liver. And then in between there, you have these reticular fibers that make up the reticuloendothelial system. And along those fibers, you'll have immune cells like macrophages and dendritic cells, part of the mononuclear phagocyte system. They move along those fibers. The actual fluid in there, so this isn't just air pockets, then of course there's fluid surrounding all of the cells, and that's the extracellular fluid. Any fluid that's not in a cell and is not in a vessel of some kind is extracellular. This reticular endothelial system you'll find in your skin, your lungs, your liver, your lymph nodes, the spleen, and your bone marrow that allow cells to move around between these different environments. Here's how they're all actually connected. So here's your blood circulation. So cells don't easily migrate out of your blood, but fluid can. So you have that big go, you're chugging non never ending amounts of energy drink to stay alive in here. So excess fluid will come out of your bloodstream, so your blood pressure remains relatively the same. This fluid, as soon as it leaves the blood vessels, counts as extracellular fluid. Then, they can migrate into lymphatic vessels, specifically lymphatic capillaries. And those are going to be open-ended. That means fluid, by just pressure, can move into a lymphatic capillary, but these ends are sort of like those saloon doors that swing that way, but they'll only swing in one direction. So extracellular fluid can only go into the lymphatic system, but it can't flow back. So pressure is high here, it forces fluid out of your blood vessels, becomes extracellular fluid, and then the pressure is still high, extracellular fluid goes into the lymphatic system. Then they'll get filtered via your lymph nodes, and at the filtered fluid will then join back into your blood circulation, and then go back into your heart, so you're not like losing that fluid completely from your blood circulation, it's just temporary out, then your blood pressure decreases and it goes back in. And if your blood pressure is already low, not much fluid is coming out of your blood vessel, this fluid just in the extracellular environment just won't flow as much into the lymphatic system. The types of cells involved then, so we have granulocytes. They're leukocytes that contain granules, little particles you see, and that's why they're called granules. Those granules will contain antimicrobial agents. And you can actually see those granules under the microscope if you looked at things like neutrophils. These types of cells also have a multi lobe nucleus. And the neutrophil is a poster child for this happening. So this is all one nucleus, but it has five different lobes to it. Three types of granulocytes we have neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils. Neutrophils are phagocytic. They're going to work early in stages of infection, usually within an hour of an injury or an infection starting somewhere. They'll migrate to that region and start grabbing up and eating up and trying to destroy a pathogen. 
basophils are going to be there to release histamine. They're the ones that cause allergies. A big part of your allergies when you have an allergic reaction like pollen or mold or pet dander or something. Those allergies are largely due to these basophils releasing things when they shouldn't be releasing them. And then you have eosinophils, also phagocytic like the neutrophils, much higher or much lower concentrations of them. These are especially important against parasites and helmets, so worms. So often if you go to like take a spring break vacation to the tropics and come back with some worm infection, if they tested this, your numbers of these would be way higher than average because you're producing a bunch of these to fight that worm infection. The agranulocytes are going to be everything that's not a granulocyte. So that's going to be leukocytes that have globular non lobe nuclei. So this counts as a non lobe nucleus versus here they're definitively like separate compartments that are just connected by a little thing in between. That's a, in each one of those is a lobe. They don't have any of those obvious granules either that these have all the little spots throughout here. Those are the cytoplasmic granules. Those you will not see in an agranulocyte. There's three general divisions of the agranulocytes. So you have monocytes, dendritic cells, and lymphocytes. The monocytes are there to mature into other types of cells that are phagocytic, called macrophages and dendritic cells. The monocytes will often migrate from the blood, go into the tissue, and become a macrophage or a dendritic cell. They are phagocytic, and they'll be important in a process we'll start on Thursday with antigen presentation. Dendritic cells are found in the skin, they're found in mucous membrane, and in the thymus. They're also phagocytic and involved in antigen presentation. And then the lymphocytes are going to be your T cells, your B cells, and the type of cell I'm not going to go into the NK cell, or natural killer cell. These are all going to be involved in your adaptive immune response. The stuff will start on Thursday. Your lymphatic system itself. So it's compartmentalized, it has its own vessels similar to blood vessels. That has its own cells and accessory organs. So things like your lymph nodes, but also your tonsils, your thymus, all of those are going to be part of your lymphatic system. The capillaries or vessels themselves are open-ended, like I said, and they're there to transport a fluid called lymph from the extremities of the body to the larger vessels and eventually to lymph nodes where that fluid gets filtered. So everywhere where you have small blood capillaries, you'll also have small lymphatic capillaries. And just as your best blood vessels then increase into arteries and veins, the same thing happens with, at the level of your lymphatic capillaries. They'll become actual lymphatic vessels. But unlike your blood circulation, where arteries take like blood away from your heart and then veins bring blood back to your heart, in the case of the lymphatics, you always have fluid flowing in one direction. Only. And it's always going to be towards the heart. So it's always going from your extremities, like say coming along your arms or your legs, and it's trying to make it back to your heart. Lymph itself is that fluid, and all it is is the extracellular fluid that came out of the blood vessels. As soon as it goes into a lymphatic vessel, it goes from being extracellular fluid to being lymph. It's great to provide an auxiliary route for extracellular fluid flow back into the blood circulation. So it's kind of like, hey, my blood pressure is high just because I drank this 44 ounce big gulp. Let me get some fluid out of my blood circulation for a bit. And then after I urinate some of this fluid out, then bring it back to me when I need it. So it's kind of what made you stash some of that excess fluid in a location until your blood pressure decreases. In the process, you'll have immune cells and reactive factors also draining into your lymphatic vessels. So that's a great way to give you surveillance, recognition, and protection based on the parts of their immune system we're going to talk about starting on Thursday, the humoral response and the cell media. So if you look in green, all these vessels are all lymphatic vessels, and you can see they're in all the same locations that you have blood vessels also. 
your lymphatic system is going to include your lymph nodes, your malt or mucosa associated lymphoid tissue, your spleen is also part of your lymphatic system, your gallt or gut associated lymphoid tissue, your thymus, your tonsils, your bone marrow, all of those are part of your lymphatic system. So things are always aiming to go back into your heart because there are these connections between your lymphatic system called the thoracic duct and your subclavian vein if you kind of know where they're at, kind of right around here along your shoulders. So thoracic duct empties filtered lymph back into your blood circulation at those locations. The lymphatic fluid itself is going to be called the lymph. That it's a plasma-like substance because it did come out of your blood circulation at some point. It's always flowing through lymphatic vessels, so lymphatic vessels never run dry. It's just if the more pressure there is, the more pressure flowing through there. But if its blood pressure is low, then there's less movement of fluid, but the, blood, the lymphatic vessels still have liquid in them. It's going to be a result of things coming out of the blood vessels, going into the extracellular spaces, and then going into the lymphatic system. In the process, they can transfer, transport white blood cells, especially lymphocytes. And a lot of these lymphocytes will hang out in your lymph node. And that's where pathogens, either by certain cells carrying them or directly by flow, will end up in the lymph nodes. And then in the lymph nodes, your B cells and T cells say, hey, I recognize this thing as something bad. I want to get rid of it or destroy it. This is going to be a means of dendritic cell migration, which we'll talk more about when we get to adaptive immunity. But dendritic cells are the best at antigen presentation. They see something like, say, in your skin, a bacterium or something. They'll pick it up, cut it up present portions of it on their surface, and then in the process migrate into your lymphatic system to alert all your B cells and T cells saying, hey, I just ran into this thing out in my arm or my foot, just letting you know what I came across if you want to do something about it. Pathogens themselves can flow directly through the tissue also, or they can be captured and taken and they can be captured and taken to your lymph nodes in certain phagocytic cells or cells like antigen presenting cells like your dendritic cells. No red blood cells should be in the lymph. Those don't exit out of the blood vessel unless you have a break in a blood vessel. The lymphatic vessels themselves, they're going to run parallel to the blood capillaries in most cases. So they'll like run along your legs, along your arms. At the capillary level, the walls are really thin, so they're only a single epithelial cell layer thick, highly permeable. So there's no problem for fluid to go into a capillary, and it's open-ended, so the flaps will open up, out, inward, fluid goes in, and if the pressure is too low, those flaps will close so fluid can't come back out. So lymph flow is always along those vessels and always in one direction, which is towards the heart. Lymph then re-enters the blood at the thoracic duct. That's going to be, like I said, around your shoulder regions up here, after they're filtered to the nearest lymph node. And you have major lymph nodes, like in your throat, you can feel them, under your armpits, your groin, in your abdominal cavity, along with, like where your stomach is. Skeletal muscle movement and extracellular fluid pressure both dictate lymphatic flow. It's a new beat. Okay. Hopefully we're okay. Otherwise, I'm blaming the person. What? <laughs> yeah. 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 Enjoy bed time. Have a good night. Bye. So that's why like when you fall asleep like and you actually manage to get like say eight hours of sleep, like very few of us ever do. But if you do, then you wake up and your legs look kind of swollen and feel kind of swollen. So that's because you don't have that skeletal muscles in your legs contracting along those lymphatic capillaries. So they're not forcing fluid to those vessels. Then of course, as you start walking around and moving, then the skeletal muscles start contracting. They'll continue to move fluid. So you don't have to have high blood pressure to cause lymphatic movement. Skeletal muscles can also contract and squeeze fluid through as well. 
So if we look at capillaries versus lymphatic vessels, so the lymphatic vessels, they'll begin as these open-ended permeable structures. So here in lighter green, that's where you'll have the extracellular fluid. Just by pressure, the you know, fluid will enter in there, and as soon as it enters those open-ended vessels, it becomes lymph goes into larger and larger vessels, and there's one-way valves that are going to prevent that backflow. So they only open in one direction, and then they'll close back if the pressure isn't strong enough. Afferent lymphatics are the lymphatics that drain into lymph nodes for filtration. Efferent lymphatics are the ones that are going out of a lymph node after the fluid has been filtered. If you take a cross-section of a lymph node, sort of a V-shaped structure, a lot of little compartments, and this is where you'll have a lot of B-cells and T-cells. They'll encounter things that are flowing through there, and those encounters may stimulate an immune response, they may not. If it's recognized as a pathogen, like something that should not be in your body, then your B-cells and T-cells will start getting activated in a process will start on Thursday, and we'll go into, oh wow, this is bad, I'm going to replicate a lot of B cells and T cells that are specific against COVID or influenza or Ebola or any other specific pathogen. A lot of tissues and organs are classified as part of your lymphatic system. So primary lymphoid organs are gonna be the actual source of immune cells. They're the ones that produce those cells. That is going to include your thymus and your bone marrow. Both of those are going to produce immune cells. And then secondary lymphoid organs are where the actual encounters with a pathogen take place. That's going to include your lymph nodes, they're the big ones that do that, but also your spleen that filters your red blood cells out, your balls or your bronchus associated lymphoid tissue, your salt or your skin associated lymphoid tissue the gall or gut associated lymphoid tissue, and your null or your nasal associated lymphoid tissue. I feel like this would be cool names for like, like the seven dwarves and their names, like <laughs> different names, balls and salt and gall and null. Was there Oh, that's the mucosal associated uh, lymphoid tissue. So yes, that is also a thing. That also will apply just to specific, like anywhere you have a mucus layer, you would have technically mold there. The thymus then is this two lobe structure kind of at, at the bottom of your neck, upper part of your chest, located in that thoracic cavity near the tip of your sternum, if you know where that is, kind of right at the base of your neck. It's responsible for immune cell development, especially in lymphocytes, through the point of puberty. And then when you get past puberty, the thymus will actually shrink down. It's, you have selection of cells that only recognize non-self in this location. So your, especially your T cells get selected for in these locations. That way, like say you have an autoimmune disease, something did not pass, or it got past this selection. Ideally, you, when you don't have any autoimmune disease, you've eliminated all the immune cells that can react to your own tissue. When you don't have that process go correctly, that's when something gets through and you can, it starts attacking your own tissue. Once things clear selection at your thymus, then it, they'll seed secondary lymphoid tissues, so then mature T cells will go hang out in your lymph nodes after they make it past your thymus and then just wait for that encounter with their specific pathogen. And in some cases that encounter will happen, in some cases it never happens in your lifetime. So you were already born with T cells and B cells that would respond to COVID. Even though no one had seen COVID yet, you were born with those cells. It's just then they get their moment in the sun when they're actually vaccinated or get exposed to the virus. Other things like Ebola. We're born with E cells and T cells that will respond to Ebola virus also, but most of us hopefully will never come and be exposed to Ebola in our lives. But they're there if they do get that chance. Then the lymph nodes themselves, so they're small, they're encapsulated, they're a bean-shaped structure, like this, the cross-section of the lymph node. 
they're found along the larger lymphatic and blood vessels. That's why you have them along your you know, armpits, groin, along your lung also, along like where your airways go up. You have bigger lymph nodes there. They're especially prominent in your thoracic and abdominal cavities, so lung and abdominal cavity around like your stomach. If they occur in clusters in regions like your armpits, the groin, and the neck, and they'll be inflamed in that area, not because of the pathogen itself, but because the B cells and T cells are replicating after being activated against a pathogen. So as their numbers increase by replication, they'll start causing swelling of those lymph nodes. And that's what you feel or the doctor feels and says, yeah, you got an infection. That's not an infection directly in your lymph node, but T cells and T cells are being activated because of an infection somewhere in your body. So this is going to be the site of those reactions to the pathogen after you filter that lymph. And then, of course, clean lymph exits the lymph node. The spleen itself, it's, been, there, it's also a lymphoid organ. It's in the upper portion of the abdominal cavity towards the back part of our body. It's there to filter blood instead of lymph, but it basically has the same structure as a lymph node. Filtration of pathogens from the blood. It also filters out old red blood cells, like every 50 to 60 days, your old red blood cells, they just get taken out of circulation and gradually disposed of as new red blood cells get made. So that's all the components. Going into phagocytosis. So, and we've already talked about this some in 3.4 as a general response. So phagocytic cell is gonna be one that's patrolling your tissue, always looking for pathogenic microbes, particulate matter, and even your own dead and dying cell. It's going to ingest those materials and degrade them through that process we described before. It gets internalized in a phagosome, fuses with a lysosome, gets broken down. If specifically macrophages and dendritic cells, which are most phagocytic cells, if they take up some of this material, they don't just spit it out. Instead, they'll cut it up into small segments and they'll put it on the surface of the cell, saying, hey, this is what I came across, so let me present these antigens. And that's why they're called antigen presenting cells. Professional phagocytic cells are going to include the neutrophils, the monocytes, the macrophages, and the dendritic cells. So neutrophils are the first responders. They're going to be the ones that also cause pus. Like if you want to pop a whitehead, all that whiteness of the pus is because you got neutrophils spitting out stuff. Monocytes are the ones that migrate from the blood into the tissues in response to an infection. Macrophages, there's resident and wandering types. The resident ones are always in a certain tissue. Like you have certain macrophages that never leave your liver or certain ones that never leave your central nervous system. The wandering types are the kinds that can migrate between different tissue types. And then dendritic cells are quite rare, but they're highly efficient at antigen presentation. Phagocytes go through a process called chemotaxis, where they want to get to a site of injury and infection. And that's based on stimuli coming from both you as the host and from the pathogen that's causing the infection. So that's that interaction between like the PAMPs the pathogen associated molecular patterns with the pattern recognition receptors on the surface of your immune cell. So PAMPs are going to be sensed by the pattern recognition receptors, like those toll-like receptors, and that signals phagocytosis to occur. So this little rod-shaped thing is a bacteria. There's interaction between receptors on the surface of the cell and the bacteria that triggers phagocytosis to occur. It gets taken up. Basically, the cell forms pseudopods or extensions of itself that wrap around the bacteria. They'll produce the phagosome, a membrane enclosed structure that carries those bacteria or whatever pathogen. Lysosomes are then going to fuse with the, that phagosome, creates a highly toxic, low pH environment, and that ideally destroys whatever the pathogen is. 
a lot of antimicrobial chemicals along with that low pH because of the acid are going to result in a bacteria dying within about 30 minutes. So pretty quick after they're internalized, they're killed. There's respiratory and oxidative burst, basically the things that you produce as byproducts during metabolism, like hydrogen peroxide. Those are the kind of things that can damage microbes. Those are great to kill things if you keep it in a controlled environment, like only in the lysosome, fusing with the phagosome, zap it with a whole bunch of oxygen and nitrogen radicals that can destroy the bacteria. The pathogenic debris then is released by exocytosis or it can be presented as small peptides on the surface of the cell. So that's just the macrophages and the dendritic cells because they have the ability to phagocytose things and do antigen presentation. So if we play a video about phagocytosis, Phagocytosis is the ingestion of a solid, such as a microorganism or cellular debris, by a eukaryotic cell. Phagocytosis is used by some protozoans for obtaining nutrients, but this process is also used by certain cells of the immune system to fight infection. These immune system cells include macrophages and neutrophils, and are collectively called phagocytes. Chemotaxis is the movement of a cell toward or away from a chemical stimulus. Phagocytes use pseudopods to move toward microorganisms or damaged cells at the site of infection, often arriving only minutes after infection. Chemotactic chemicals that attract phagocytes include microbial products, components of damaged cells, chemicals released by other white blood cells, and peptides derived from the complement system. The plasma membrane of phagocytes usually attaches to glycoproteins on the microorganism's surface. This process is called adherence. Adherence is made easier through opsonization, a process in which antibodies or complement proteins from the host coat the microbe surface, serving as handles so that the phagocyte can more easily attach to the microorganism. The proteins that coat the microbe are called opsonins. The pseudopods fuse, forming a sac called a phagosome. The phagosome enters the cytoplasm, where it fuses with lysosomes that contain digestive enzymes and other antimicrobial substances. The fused structure is called a phagolysosome. Digestion of most bacteria is complete within 10 to 30 minutes. After phagocytosis, the remaining debris is eliminated from the cell by exocytosis, in which the phagolysosome fuses with the plasma membrane and expels its contents. Some of the contents of the phagolysosome may also be presented on the cell membrane through a process called antigen processing and presentation. Let's review the steps in phagocytosis. The pseudopods of a phagocyte use chemotaxis to approach the microorganism. The pseudopods adhere to opsonins that are attached to the phagocyte. The microbe is ingested within a phagosome. The phagosome fuses with a lysosome to form a phagolysosome, in which digestive enzymes break apart the microorganism. Finally, the remaining debris is eliminated by exocytosis. Parts of the microorganism are presented on the surface of the phagosome.
So, inflammation is also part of that second level of defense, basic things that happen. And inflammation is something that can happen due to a variety of things, being exposed to a pathogen, but someone just smacking you because you failed the last micro exam. Either case can cause inflammation. So it's a non-specific reaction to some harmful event in the tissue. There's four classic signs and symptoms of inflammation, and these are their Latin and English terms. Although a lot of these Latin terms are similar to the Spanish terms, which may help some of you remember them. So rumor is also redness, and that's gonna be caused by that increased circulation to a site of inflammation. Calor or color, that's gonna be warm, and that's gonna be caused because you have increased blood flow to an area of inflammation. So just by friction, there's against the blood vessels and tissue, there's more heat generated. Tumor, same thing as like a tumor in cancer. So it's a swelling, and that's gonna be caused because you have increased extracellular fluid going out of the blood circulation and into the tissue. And dolor or dolar, that's gonna be the last one. That's gonna be the pain that's associated with inflammation. And that's gonna be caused because you have all this excess fluid, you have damage to the nerves, and you're having chemical mediators being released by damaged cells, like cytokines being released. And all of those together signal that there's pain. So between all of those things, usually you realize, oh crap, I have inflammation going on. And because of those, you often will have a fifth non-classical sign or symptom, which is loss of function. Like if your finger is all swelled up, you tell yourself, hey, I don't want to use this finger because it is all swelled up and red and in pain. Yeah, the Spanish would definitely help in some of this. So classical responses, if you have, say have a nice, awesome rose bush at your house, so you get stabbed by a thorn, that's your injury, so you get the redness and heat that's going to come from that initial blood flow that's going there, and of course the increased blood flow means increased redness because there's more blood, and then the heat by the friction. Then the swelling because you have that extracellular fluid coming into the tissue itself out of the blood, that's your tumor, and then the dolor that goes from the pain because of the damage to your nerve cells and the chemical signals, and that's associated with the loss of function that you often say that, hey, I'm going to quit using this because there's so much inflammation going on. What are the goals of inflammation? So obviously you want to attract components of the immune system to that side of tissue injury because you want to start the healing process as quick as possible. There's trigger mechanisms to repair tissue, and those are going to come along with that inflammation process. And you want to clear away harmful substances. If there's something toxic, like a toxin produced by a bacteria at a certain infection site, you bring in, say, extracellular fluid, that's going to dilute that toxin also. Ideally, between all of this, you'll contain and kill the pathogen that's invaded the tissue, and you, you'll try to do that you know, within hours of the exposure. Inflammation can be acute, where it just lasts a few minutes to a few hours, like when you get a paper cut or something, initially it hurts like hell, but say within an hour or two, you can't even find where you had that paper cut. That's acute inflammation. You can also have chronic inflammation. That's things like you know, rheumatoid arthritis or something like that, where it goes on many years or even a lifetime. So if we go through step by step what happens in this area. Yeah, so just blank it and then run the sample. Moving right along. I mean, it's not the best of lining up values for minutes with numbers, but as long as a total of 10 values show up, we're doing okay. <laughs> yeah, that sounds reasonable. That's what I mean. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah, that gets us back on track. <laughs> we're good. So if we go step by step on it, what happens during an infl inflammatory process. So you have tissue injury, like you step on a thumbtack or rusty nail or something. So there's bacteria coating that nail. So there's damage to your blood vessels, there's damage to the tissue cells, some of them died. 
platelets are immediately coming in to try to seal the clot or form a clot, so you quit bleeding all over. All of those are going to together release chemical mediators and various cytokines. There's also cells called mast cells that are already found in the tissue, and those will immediately release a chemical called histamine, the same chemical you get during allergic responses. In this case, though, it's a good thing. So that histamine is going to cause rapid vasoconstriction. It, you want to constrict the diameter of your blood vessel so you decrease the bleeding that's occurring because you stepped on this nail or cap. Clot is going to quickly form then as the platelets pile up. It's a positive feedback system. So the more platelets pile up, the more platelets that come there, which cause more platelets to come there, and positive feedback like that. Once you form that clot, vasodilation actually occurs in that, the surrounding regions of the blood vessels. Because now you want fluids and actual cells to come out of your blood vessel. So that increases the flow of blood to that site of injury, and in the process, you'll have that redness and heat take place that are the classic signs and symptoms of inflammation. This will allow an influx of innate immune cells really quick within like a few minutes of the injury especially neutrophils, they'll start coming in earliest in the response. You have the redness and warmth, and that alerts you as the victim that, oh crap, I just stepped on this nail or thumped at, or got jabbed by this thorn of a rose bush. In the actual blood vessels, we start off with a process called margination. The blood vessel cells are flowing in the middle of a blood, west blood vessel normally, as blood is just flowing through your body. But now say you have this injury out here in this corner. Damaged cells are down here. They're going to release chemotactic factors, things that are going to attract white blood cells from your blood circulation. And it causes a concentration gradient with the highest concentration at the exact site of the damage and then less and less going further away. So these blood cells, the immune cells, they have receptors on their surface to be able to sense that, oh, I just sensed a certain cytokine or chemokine or something attractive. So this is where I need to slow down. I need to quit flowing in the middle of this pipe that is your blood vessel and start rolling along the wall instead. So white blood cells will stick to the inside of these endothelial walls in response to binding to some of these cytokines that can come through the blood vessel wall. Next step is diapedesis. So that's where these white blood cells are going to be Wow, that's some emotion. Usually you're the calming effect in here. You're not supposed to have listened to that kind of response. So now our white blood cells actually migrate out of the blood vessels. Fine, leave me. So white blood vessels, the white blood cells, they'll come through these gaps that occur between your endothelial cells. They'll, once they come out of the blood vessels, because they already started sticking and rolling along here, the diapedesis is that actual process where they'll squeeze into a shape like a mouse squeezes through a hole in the wall and they pop out outside your blood vessel. But they'll keep migrating in response to this concentration of white blood cells, of the chemotactic factors. So that's the actual process of chemotaxis. They're migrating along a concentration gradient of these cytokines and chemokines until they get to the actual site of injury. So like in your foot, if you stepped on a thumb tack or a rusty nail or something, nearest blood vessels start leaking blood, clot from the clot, then the blood, these white blood cells come out of the blood vessels and they'll gradually go through the tissue until they get to the actual spot where the damage happened. Going back to our actual site of infection or damage, when you have those post-capillary venules, the capillaries that are away from the actual site of injury by a little bit, when they constrict, that's going to cause circulation to slow. Like you have a garden hose and you kink it on both ends and everything swells up in the middle. That's basically what's going to happen at this site. And that forces more extracellular fluid to come out of your vessel. And that causes that pooling and associated swelling or the tumor that you have during inflammation. The endothelial walls of these venules 
veins and next level are the venules before you get to capillary, they become more permeable. Then all these chemical attacking factors, they're also binding to receptors on your venules that cause them to be leaky. So they form gaps in between them that makes it easier for cells to come out of the blood vessels and go into the tissue. Cytokines are going to cause the capillaries to continue leaking, and the result of this is that edema at the site of injury. And this is good because if whatever is at the site, like bacteria or some other pathogen, is producing toxins, this will dilute it. Just by having more fluid there, the actual concentration of the toxin is going to be less. When you form pus, so it's going to be a combination of your white blood cells, especially your neutrophils, the bacteria and then the actual debris, like the damaged and dying cells that got damaged during the injury. Neutrophils are immediately, like within minutes, coming to that site of tissue damage. Then that's followed by monocytes within a few hours. And between the neutrophils and monocytes, ideally they're containing the damage. They're keeping it to at least that specific region. Exudate is going to be the liquid that escapes into the tissues, and that can be serous or purulent. And that's what you'll hear, like, or you may be noting down as a nurse, like, oh, the patient still has a serous exudate or a purulent exudate, you're like doing patient monitoring. So that's if it's clear and thin and watery, then it's serous. If it's purulent, it's going to be thick and milky, and that means there's more neutrophils involved in it. The edema and phagocytosis that's going on with the neutrophils and monocytes, they'll clear most mild infections to where within a day you're healed up. Macrophages then come to the area after the neutrophils and monocytes have done the heavy lifting. And they're there kind of as the garbage. So they're coming at the end and they are clear the site of your dead cells, your debris, all the pus, the damaged tissue, all of that gets eaten up by the macrophages and nice systematically degraded so that the inflammation is decreased. Ideally, you're left with like no permanent damage, so the tissue gets completely repaired and you can't even tell that there was damage, or you get replacement by a scar that's where you'll have connective tissue form where you originally had some other type of tissue. And that's often something cool like this on your hand where you can show off, hey, I got this cool scar to show off. That's when it's going to be replaced with actual connective tissue. So if we watch a video to wrap things up, I guess we did just get through all the people in time. It's a great summary of Damage to the body's tissues through heat, chemicals, sunburn, cuts, or microbial infections triggers a general, nonspecific defensive response called inflammation. Signs and symptoms of inflammation include redness, pain, heat, swelling, and sometimes loss of function. Inflammation has three main functions. To destroy the agent causing injury, to limit the effects of the agent on the rest of the body, and to repair or replace damaged tissue.